Theologian, the new theologian, and um, now we're going to do the second half of the homily. It's kind of a long homily. But before we start with the second half, let's do a quick review of the first half. Okay? Um, we know that in the first homily, he talked about he talked about the sin of Adam, basically, and, and what happened. Um, and now this is speaking about the incarnation of Christ and his... Um, because the sentence was cast. If you remember <coughs> that Adam became... Adam was an eternal being, but God did not want him to be eternally in a fallen state or a bad state or a dead state. Um, and so he uh, b basically um, allowed death to happen to Adam so that he was mortal. We're going to learn more about this today. As a matter of fact, we, we get to listen to Father Seraphim Rose today. We have some a treat for you a little bit later. But um, if you look at this, the uh, first created man, this, uh, this outline here that you have as a handout, Remember that um, this is what the notes that we said here, and I'll read them to you real quick. Number one, that human nature through the incarnation of the Son, God the Word, comes again into the blessed state, that is, into the good and divine condition in which it was until the transgression of Adam. And this was the idea that this was intended for Adam. However, he was not... Um, he not only was tempted and succumbed to temptation, but he didn't repent. And that was a big thing, uh, a big problem, because living in a state like that, remember we talked about God having to pass the sentence, because whenever there is an action such as that, there has to be a, 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 a sentence that is uh, as a result of a transgression. So God made the sentence for Adam, and he was condemned to death both a spiritual and a physical death. Um, so if you go back to this, number one, A, it is essential for us to know what Adam was before the loss of the blessed state. Num uh, B, the Holy Fathers tell us that God became man in order that through his becoming man, he might again raise up human nature to the blessed state. And C, God, in the beginning when he created man, created him holy, passionless, and sinless in his own image and likeness. D. Inalterability and unchanging are the characteristics of the unoriginated and uncreated divinity alone. This does not apply to any other part of his creation. It is only God alone who is unchanging. E. The created man naturally was alterable and changeable, although he had the means and the possibility with the help of God not to be subject to alteration and change. In other words, God could make that available to man, but certainly not in the fallen state. So, I guess you could say, Adam blew it. D. But since there was nothing except what was very good, the divine, this divine man had no need of the law in the beginning, even Adam. As in his blessed state, he didn't need a law. And the only thing that was given was a commandment of not to eat of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. God even said, you can eat the tree of life. It's kind of picture this. It's kind of, here's the tree of life, and here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you can't eat this tree, but you can eat the, tr the tree of life. So then, we're going to learn a little bit about the tempter from Father Seraphim Rose. Number two, likewise of the natural law written and spiritually. A, however, inasmuch as it was in his power to eat of every tree of paradise, and from the very tree of life itself, there was given to him a commandment not to eat from one tree only. B, this was so that Adam might know that he was alterable and changeable and might be where and might always remain in that good and divine condition. In other words, God made a rule for Adam 
because Adam wasn't God. And so he had to let Adam know in this way that he could be alterable and changeable, not exactly like God. He wouldn't be alterable or changeable. So he gave him a commandment and said, you can't eat of that one. There's more to it, but that's the beginning of the saga. C. God, by those words which he said to him in giving the commandment that if he should eat, he would die, gave him to understand that he was alterable and changeable. D. But after man had eaten of the forbidden tree, he died a bitter death, that is, had fallen away from God and had become subject to corruption, which he hadn't been prior to not tasting of the fruit. E. So that man might not fall completely away from every good, there was given him a law in order that it might indicate what was good and what was bad. So remember last week we talked about that, that uh, even at the time of Moses, um, when, the, when the Ten Commandments were given, these were given for the benefit of man so that they could know the difference between right and wrong. F. Afterwards, however, Christ came and intimately joined in himself the divinity with humanity. And the divinity and humanity became one person, although they remained unconfused and unmingled. The person of Christ in his humanity and in his divinity. So that teaching right there is what separates the Oriental Orthodox from us. So sometimes new people ask me, what about the Coptics, what about the Ethiopians, what about the Armenians? Well, the Armenians believe that, especially the Armenians, they believe that that, they, that he had two nations, but they were mingled. So that the, human, the godly over, overshadowed the humanity. And, uh, and they try to claim that St. Athanasius, uh, uh, you know, patriarch, was one of the people that did, said that, but it's just not true. And uh, so, anyway, that's just to say, it lives in our present time period, that very confused, even after Christ rose from the dead, even after 400 years of Christianity, the people still didn't quite get it. And that was the fourth council. That was the fourth council. Chalcedon. Chalcedon, right. Yeah, I always say that um, they couldn't make it to the meeting. <laughs> well, it's true, actually. You know, I, I like the way Father uh, Bishop, or now Metropolitan, Callistos Ware describes that in the Orthodox Church, the book called The Orthodox Church. He says that, in fact, due to various reasons, they actually couldn't make it to the meeting. And so they said, we will not abide by the things that were um, um, uh, adopted in that meeting because we weren't there, we weren't witnesses, and you didn't consult with us before you made it. Uh, a role for the church. So that created a rift. And that rift, um, unfortunately, to, even to this day, hasn't been healed, although many of the faithful see, we, we see each other as one in the body of Christ at the level of hierarchy and at the level of, of function and holy communion, the sacraments. We can't be in union with each other or co what's called being in communion with each other. But that doesn't mean that... Well, the Coptics are the closest, but they still have to um, give up on some of their saints that were um, part of the heresy. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have to also <coughs> recognize all seven of the ecumenical councils, which they you know, haven't officially done, although I hear that they negotiated. And uh, so it's close with the Coptics, but not necessarily with the Ethiopians or with the... Um, the Ethiopians would say that we've always believed that, but they still have at the bottom of their liturgy two natures mingled. So, so we're we're hopeful that um, as time progresses and and communication continues, that uh, it, because it's really up to the hierarchies of these churches. It's not up to the faithful. And we we can love each other. <laughs> <laughs> and the, it's not we it's, love each other. if a Coptic, if an Armenian, if a, uh, one of those Chalcedon, uh, non Chalcedonian uh, people come to mm -hmm. an Orthodox church individually, they can be received into confession. They have to say the creed, make them do it three times. And they have to, like, say they're not going to go back. Now, because they have to choose. They have to choose either which way. 
You know, it's very hard because if you're raised in one of those ethnic cultures, it's very hard to break away from your ethnic background. So I don't know how that all holds. But every once in a while, one will come here for a period of time. But in other places where there are no other churches, they go to the Greek Orthodox Church a lot. Because when we were in St. Thomas Elias in San Bernardino, a third of that congregation was made up of Ethiopians. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw them. There was a lot of them yeah. there, and they used to make little, those little noises. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. just the white and yeah. the And they were sweet. They're very, they're very wonderful people. Okay, there's two more points to this, and then we'll move on um, from the history. Uh, Christ, um, num G, Christ brought forth for man as fruit for him the blessed state. Christ brought that for all of us. Um, that is, and then these are the fruits of the, of the uh, blessed state, J love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, mercifulness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And now, H, all man's striving and all his struggle must be directed to acquiring the Spirit of Christ, and in this way to bring forth the fruits of the Holy Spirit. For in this consists the spiritual law and the blessed state. And it's italicized there because it's the spiritual law as opposed to the law that comes down and is handed down through the ages uh, by man's hand from God. This is what is right. This is what is wrong. Don't do this. Do this. That kind of thing. The spiritual law is, is a much higher state uh, from a point of the blessed state. The spiritual law almost goes without saying you see because it's likeness to christ so it's not like you have to define it and also the idea of the blessed state itself what defines the blessed state is how much we are like christ and that in, in as much as we're we have the likeness of christ we are known by god and he and he gives us the blessed state so, dear, do you want to talk before we put Father Seraphim on? Um, not yet. We'll put him on. Okay. Oh, so, so let me just introduce this, okay? Basically, um, when we became Orthodox back in the 80s, um, you come up with a job here. When we became Orthodox back in the 80s, um, the Platina Brotherhood used to put on seminars called uh, the New Belong Academy. And uh, it was based on what Father Seraphim Rose and what Father Herman had done at Platina, which is they would um, have, uh, twice a year they would have um, gatherings of people and Father Seraphim would directly teach. Uh, mostly he taught. Father Herman probably taught as well, but mostly he taught. And um, so he gave lectures. And then Father Seraphim also traveled around. Like the book we have, we just got it back in, Nihilism, was a lecture he gave uh, at Santa Cruz, you know, you see Santa Cruz, and people that were in attendance were, were like were people like Father Damascene, Father Gerasim, uh, Metropolitan Jonah, and a myriad of other abbots and abbesses and bishops and priests. That you know, the, the spiritual children of of the of Father Seraphim in particular, several in Rocor, many in Rocor. There were, there were many in Rocor as well. So just to say. Um, and they end the same way we do with joy of all the sorrow. I mean, we learn from them, and we like maintain what they do. So this talk that Father Seraphim is giving is part of that uh, uh, academy, and he warns them all at the end. When we, get, when, when we get to the end of it, which won't be tonight, he warns them all that, um, in fact, there'll be a test. Do you, okay, make sure you take good notes. So I thought... Maybe that's what we need is a test, you know. But uh, the test will be, I will be, I'll be quizzing you at the end of the class. So just remember that. All okay, right. now uh, we're going to, um, Alexa, connect to my iPhone. Alexa, this connect a, to my iPhone. This is our Alexa, but it has a nice volume. Searching. You're already connected to iPhone. Okay. So, so connect to different device. Go to the Bluetooth settings okay. on your mobile device. So just remember that. <laughs> That he, no, that, um, that this is, um, he's talking, we, we're seven minutes in, you can find this on YouTube, by the way, uh, but we're seven minutes in right now, the name of his lecture, it's an hour and a half, almost an hour and a half, the name of the lecture is called The Fall of Adam and Eve, a talk by Father Seraphim Rose, that's how you can find it on YouTube, 
And uh, so far, according to this particular presentation, it's had 24,000 views. Um, okay, so let's play it. The deed and the way things work are always very big companies. But he would not have needed to come to redeem us if I had not seen it. Oh, yes, of course, it's all very deep, very profound. And yeah, we get, yeah. we'll see at the end, I'll quote a few of the services which talk about these things. It's the theology of the church which is constantly given to us because that's what keeps us in remembrance of what we came from and where we are going. Now, we'll go on. <clears throat> To the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of paradise. We're going to do this for about eight minutes. St. Gregory, the theologian, speaks about this. Says that God gave Adam in paradise a law as a material for his free will to act upon. This law was a commandment as to what plants he might partake of and which one he might not touch. This latter was the tree of knowledge. Not, however, because it was evil from the beginning when planted, nor was it forbidden because God grudged it to us. Let not the enemies of God wag their tongues in that direction and imitate the serpent. But it would have been good if partaken of at the proper time. For the tree was, according to my theory, contemplation, which it is only safe for those who have reached maturity of habit to enter upon, but which is not good for those who are still somewhat simple and greedy, just as neither is solid food good for those who have yet tender, are yet tender and have need of milk. St. John Damascene writes, quote, <clears throat> The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the power of discernment by multiple vision, and this is the complete knowing of one's own nature. Of itself it manifests the magnificence of the Creator, and it is good for them that are full grown and have walked in the contemplation of God. For them that have no fear of changing, because in the course of time they have acquired a certain habit of such contemplation. It is not good, however, for such as are still young and are more greedy in their appetites. For because of the uncertainty of their perseverance in the true good, and because of their not yet being solidly established in their application to the only good, are naturally inclined to be drawn away and distracted by their solicitude for their own bodies. And St. John Chrysostom says, quote, The tree of life is in the midst of paradise as a reward, the tree of knowledge as an object of contest and struggle. Having kept the commandment regarding this tree, you will receive a reward. And behold the wondrous thing, everywhere in paradise, every kind of tree blossoms, everywhere they are abundant in fruit. Only in the center are these two trees as an object of battle and exercise. End of quote. This is a profound subject. It's very much bound up with our human nature. In fact, I think we see something of this very temptation that Adam had in human life today. Although Adam has not fallen, so that's different from our present state. Nonetheless, the state in which Adam was is similar to the state of, say, a young person, 16, 17, 18 years old, who's brought up in goodness, and then comes to the, the age when he must himself make the choice to be good or not. And it so happens that because we have freedom, that there must be a choice. I must consciously will to do good. You can't simply be good because somebody tells you to be good. Sooner or later, your freedom must actively choose the good, or else it does not become part of you. <clears throat> That's true of everyone except, of course, a child who dies and quite young. And therefore, when one comes to this age, when one must become a man, it's then that one must make the same choice Adam made. Either to freely choose to do the good, or else to make the mistake and go into evil, that is to enter into the life of sin. Because the, all these fathers say the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is something which is only for mature people. And because we have freedom, it cannot be that we will not have knowledge of evil. The only choice is whether we have knowledge of evil through the mistakes of others or through ourselves overcoming evil because everyone, in order to become a mature Christian, to be established in the way of doing good, has to know about evil. He has to know what it is that he's chosen not to do. And this knowledge can be without falling into great sins. 
that you are willing to take the examples of others, but if you are able to see, almost as if it's your own experience, you're able to see when somebody else makes a tremendous sin, and you can see the result of that. And then you can make that part of your experience without falling into sin. And evidently, that's what Adam could have done. If he had resisted this temptation, once he had resisted it, he would have seen that there was a temptation. That is, everything isn't perfect. There's something, somebody out to get him. And as the second temptation would have come, he would have seen that the serpent or whatever else was used by the devil is out to make him fall. And then he would have begun to realize there is such a thing as evil, there is such a thing as an evil will which wants to make him lose his paradise. And through this, he could have obtained that knowledge of evil and eventually tasted of that tree. The tree itself is only a tree. It's a symbolic one. But it opens up to him because that he, he, the tasting of it means disobeying the commandment. And therefore, he learns about evil through disobeying the commandment. But if he didn't do that, the other choice is choose the way of sin and thereby discover in bitter experience what it means to be evil. And to repent of that and come back to goodness. <coughs> and that's the path that Adam chose. And because of that, the, our whole nature is changed and that's the path that everybody goes through. Except that each person is free, the same as Adam. Although we're, of course, born in sins already, and small children are filled with all kinds of evil things, nonetheless, real evil does not come in until one is consciously choosing to be evil. And that's the choice of adulthood. So in a sense, everybody tastes of this tree, or else refrains from tasting it and goes in the path of goodness. So unfortunately, the, the odds are far against surviving without falling into these evils. Although there's no reason, because we see now the evil all around us. We have instructors, we have holy fathers. And it's quite possible for a person to be raised in Christianity, well, like St. Sergius of Rodinus, or other saints who were in monasteries from their childhood. They can be surrounded by good examples. They can see the results of evils in others, and they can choose not to do that themselves. So theoretically, it's quite possible. In practice, in bitter practice, usually it happens that we taste the tree by sinning ourselves. <laughs> Any questions on that? I mean, you said that uh, Adam realized his tr true nature. I mean, when, 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 when Adam realized yeah. his true nature. Yeah, but, yeah. At that point, did he realize, just realize his, his free will, or realize his freedom at that point? Well, this whole, because once he disobeyed, all these things began to happen. He realized he was naked and he saw that he was running away from God and he began to make excuses. There was the whole path which is the consequence of sin was opened up to him. So he saw this depth in himself that he's able to choose evil even though he didn't really intend to. So he wasn't really conscious of his free will until that time? Well, the father said he was like in a state of a, although he's adult in body, but in mind, very simple. In fact, very exalted in mind. No, he was able to give names to the animals, but still very simple because untested. He was in a state of goodness without being tested by evil. And it was God's plan for Adam was for him to discover um, his freedom by tasting of the tree of knowledge when he was ready. And then uh, Adam already when he he would have observed. The Father don't talk about this particular aspect. That's my idea. But I think that when he observed that there were temptations, that would have been for him the opening of the awareness of evil. Before he even took the fruit. Yeah. And then, then in itself would have been like tasting the tree when he was mature for it, ready for it. So, so it wasn't unconscious that time? Yeah. Unconscious. No, it wasn't, it wasn't deliberate then, because he knew it before. Well, he knew one thing, that there was a commandment. Mm -hmm. But he was not tested in obeying the commandment. Yet. And in his simplicity, he fell. <clears throat> yes? Mr. Mr. Well, because she was the first, she was the one who first was deceived. It was through her that it happened. Does this mean that he, when he partook of the apple, he knew what was coming? Well, we'll go more into that as we go and see the, the historical sequence of events. Nobody said it was an apple, by the way. <laughs> Some people think it was a fig. Oh. But it's a Western idea that it's an apple. It's no, I'm not getting particular information about that. It's just a tree, a fruit. <clears throat> okay. Um, it's probably enough because uh, you can listen to this on your own. It's a very, very interesting presentation. Well, I want um, to give them the advice about Adam being a superman. Oh, is that coming right up? I can't yeah. remember that. Okay, we'll give it a little bit more.
Um, just remember that he was. Um, well, we want. I want you to hear this part about Adam, who he was, because okay. I think that we miss that. In this is uh, so, so far, Adam. We miss what? We miss that in Western thinking. Oh, oh, okay. How remarkable he was as a human being. Yeah, that's right. He does talk about that. Okay. Does not follow. Genesis two eighteen to twenty. It says. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. This does not mean, as the rationalist scholars say, that there's a total contradiction between this and the first chapter, and that here all the creatures are created after Adam. That's not the, what it says at all. It simply it describes the creation of man, that first there was man and then woman, and then incidentally it says that all these creatures had been created and they were not found as a companion for him. <clears throat> the animals are brought to Adam because their place, according to the Holy Father, is not in paradise but in the earth outside of paradise. Paradise is meant for the dwelling of man alone. An indication that man alone of all earthly creatures is meant for the heavenly kingdom to which he can descend from paradise through keeping the commandments of God. St. John Damison writes that paradise, quote, was a divine place and a worthy habitation for God in his image. And in it no brute beast dwells, but only man, the handiwork of God. St. John Chrysostom says, quote, Adam was given the whole earth, but his chosen dwelling was paradise. He could also go outside of paradise, but the earth outside of paradise was assigned for the habitation not of man, but of the irrational an animals, the quadrupeds, the wild beasts, the and crawling things. The royal and ruling dwelling for man was paradise. This is why God brought the animals to Adam, because they were separated from him. Slaves do not always stand before their Lord, but only when there is need for them. The animals were named and immediately sent away from paradise. Adam alone remained in paradise. End of quote. <clears throat> the Holy Fathers interpret the naming of the animals by Adam quite literally and see in it an indication of man's dominion over them, his undisturbed harmony with them, and a wisdom and intellect in the first man which far surpasses anything since known to man. St. Ephraim the Syrian writes about this, quote, the words he brought them unto Adam show the wisdom of Adam and the peace which existed between the animals and man before man transgressed the commandment. For they came together before man as before a shepherd filled with love. Without fear, according to kinds and types, they passed before him in flocks, neither fearing him nor trembling before him. It is not impossible for a man to discover a few names and keep them in his memory, but it surpasses the power of human nature and it's difficult for him to discover in a single hour thousands of names and not to give the last of those names the names of the first. This is the work of God, and if it was done by man, it was given him by God. Remember, this is a sign of really divine intelligence in Adam. And St. John Chrysostom writes, quote, God does this in order to show us the great wisdom of Adam, and also so that in the giving of, in the giving of names might be seen a sign of dominion. Just think what wisdom was needed to give names to so many kinds of birds, reptiles, wild and domestic animals, and other irrational creatures, to give them all names and names belonging to them and corresponding to each kind. <clears throat> Just think of how the lions and leopards, vipers and scorpions and serpents and all the other, even more ferocious animals, came to Adam as to a lord, with all submission in order to receive names from him. And Adam did not fear a single one of these wild beasts. The names which Adam gave them remain until now. God confirmed them so that we might constantly remember the honor which man received from the Lord of all when he received the animals under his authority and might ascribe the reason for the removal of this honor to man himself who lost his authority through sin. End of quote from St. John Chrysostom. Because man possesses in himself something of the animal nature as we have seen and this animal nature became dominant in him because of the fall, Therefore, Adam's naming of the animals also indicates the original dominion of man's mind over the lower passion of nature. Now uh, this, St. Ambrose writes, quote, The beasts of the field and the birds of the air which were brought to Adam are our irrational senses, 
because beasts and animals represent the diverse passions of the body, whether of the more violent kind or even of the more temperate. God granted to you the power of being able to discern by the application of sober logic the species of each and every object, in order that you may be induced to form a judgment on all of them. God called them all to your attention so that you might realize that your mind is superior to all of them. Okay. Next point, the creation of Eve. Okay. Right. So that got in 20 yeah, minutes. The next part of the lecture he gives, he goes on to how, you know, Adam fell asleep, the rib was taken out, and Eve was formed from the rib. And he, he definitely talks about Eve being in uh, subjection, to, you know, in a sense, subjection, like, like uh, under Adam, you might know, say, like in the head of, like he's the head of the, the household type thing. Well, he, but, but in the beginning, she was equal to him. And then, according to this lecture by Father Seraphim, and um, you can read it in the scriptures, as a result of the fall, of the fall men, women became subject to men and wives to their husbands, etc. That that was a direct consequence of Eve succumbing to temptation. And we'll hear more about it uh, next time. Uh, we don't. We want to stick with Saint Simeon. Though we don't want to get too far off, because actually a lot of this writing is in the book by the Saint Herman Press, which is called First Created. Uh, it's called First Creation. What's it called? Uh, creation. Um, An early man. An early man. So it's that big thick one that people would probably refer to as a good uh, doorstop, <laughs> but it's uh, actually filled with a lot of. If you read it slowly. It's filled with a lot of really good information. I'm in my glasses here. So we're going to um, start. This is the Any no. questions? Let me just ask, are there any questions you had about what you heard? Yes. So are they saying that animals can't go anywhere after they die? Like, do they have a separate area where they eat their animals? There's not, they're not in paradise, is what he's saying. Well, it's not really clear. Um, because later, it's clear what he says. It's though. clear what he says, but it says that um, <clears throat> when it says, uh, "And the meat shall inherit the earth," that there's different layers of where people will be in the blessed state, and that some, he says, would be on the earth, and some would be. I mean, in other words, there's many levels to the kingdom of God, many mansions, as the saying goes. So that there, we don't know, but what he's saying is there could be. Um, Let me liken it to something, okay, because yeah. then you'll hear this. If you looked at the order of angels, the orders and ranks of angels, each order and rank of angels has a job. The archangels, the thrones, the minions, the principalities, etc., etc., the various levels of angels, each angel does their job complete, perfectly in obedience to the will of God. They've chosen to live that way. There's only one angel, that, the, the main angel that did disobeyed God was, of course, Lucifer, who was the, who was the brightest of all angels. But he, did, he, was, he, he was jealous because man was created. He foresaw man being created and living in paradise and, anyway, being higher than the angels. So, um, so therefore... In that realm of in the realm of eternity, and there are many mansions, and my, you know, in my house, you know, we all want to get in, you know, to live in one of them, um, even if it's the one on the lower edge of uh, paradise, whatever we want to be in paradise, and that's created for man. You just have to take God at His word. It's created for man. Yeah. And, now and what happened? Father, and now we know that God is merciful and loving and kind. So the animals, well, He's taking care of them too. Because but. it says, and just to make sure that people know that it, Jesus Himself spoke to that and said, "And there will be a new heaven and a new earth in the end times." And and the thing is that if you look at the lives of saints, like Saint Sarah from Asurah and his, uh, the, you know, or Saint Mary of Egypt and the lion. And, uh, and and the various, there's been so many stories of, of St. Saints, Herman of Alaska. St. Herman of Alaska, walking with animals, you know, and then being, you know, bowing, like the lion with the story of St. <coughs> Mary of Egypt, where he bowed down at the grave, you know, he did a prostration at her grave with 
Zosimus, the, the monk, uh, who was out there to, to bury her. You know, he helped bury her and then, you know, bowed down. And uh, so there's this, I see that it's, um, there's an, there has to be an understanding that God made Adam, he was a superman. There never was a man like Adam, not ever since. Jesus Christ, who is fully God, became that perfect man to redeem us. You know, that was his mercy, God's mercy. But and only he could, only, only God could, could redeem us. You know, we couldn't change the curse, you might say. We couldn't change the curse of corruption. And even to this day, we only, we only overcome it as we live in our bodies and we have our bodies. We live with our soul and our body together as we choose good over evil. As we, as we choose good over evil. It's important to understand that we have to choose good over evil every day of our life. And that there's no excuse for not choosing good over evil. But that there, the church provides a way for one to be cleansed on a continuous basis through communion, through confession, through unction, through you know all sorts of ways uh, to the, God, the, the, the church provides for people. But you understand that for Adam and Eve it was a rough go. They had they were cast out, and they could they they could see paradise all the days of their life. And they didn't. They says that they never repented until they were cast out of paradise. Well, and it's interesting because uh, what what uh, Father Seraphim was reading, I think it was the words of Saint John Chrysostom. Um, said it was one of the fathers. Uh, just now, what we were listening to, if you remember, he said, and Adam could choose to leave and go and be with the animals and go back. He could come and go. He was free to come and go anywhere on the earth, and he chose paradise as the place he liked the best. You know. So he could go and be with the animals, he could do whatever he wanted, but he could go back into paradise. There was an open door there. I mean, it's just hard to imagine the divine knowledge it would take to name all the creatures, each one according to their type or their kind, and to name each one and each thing, and to give names that still reverberate through time and in history even to this day. So for us, you know, we live in a, 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 a time period where we, where mankind has, instead of, you know, living in the earth kind of without a lot of putting a lot of blemishes on it, through our sort of greedy, sinful nature, we kind of do the opposite. And so the concept, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, we don't really buy into that concept as, as, a, group, as a group of people. And uh, that we, that's another lecture for another series that we do and we do following this one at some point little where we'll talk about the Orthodox worldview, you know, basically how we turn from an, even a totally agrarian society to a mechanized uh, industrialized society where the society that we live in today where people are so tuned into the technology, to technology, things that live in the... Uh, floating world of nothing, air basically, where the demons live, by the way, where the demons live, you see that's one of the problems that... Father, that Father Seraphim calls that the fourth dimension. The what? Where the demons live, he calls right. that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. They believe me that they live in the air, and believe me that there are yet a lot of young people who venture into these kind of games and play these kind of things, and they keep from going further out and out, and, and we have, I have a good, couple of good friends that experience firsthand uh, being uh, snatched by the grab by the demons, seeing them as they are, and literally crying and saying Jesus Christ, and they lost their power over him. And uh, I can tell you, I know his story well. And uh, he he had been an atheist, complete non-believer. He had ventured into the early days of all that kind of like psychic dimension stuff. And, you know, he was very successful, as he was doing very well, uh, making money, you know, moving up in the music industry and the whole thing. And then that happened, and it changed his life. And for a while, he tried monasticism, but it didn't really fit for him. So he's married now with a, with a couple of kids. But just to say that I've known others beside him as well. I'm just 
was saying to you that it's a real thing, and so that's one of the things we want to, we have these classes for, because you need to be aware that people can get caught up in this stuff to such an extent that they lose their mind, and they lose their ability to stay focused. So we're going to continue, though, with the class. So this, uh, this whole um, homily is, is called the blessed state. And as he said at the beginning, if you have the two, uh, this is two halves, uh, make a whole here. Um, the first section said, you know, in order for us to understand the, um, what it is that we're going for, we have to understand what the blessed state is, and in particular, what the blessed state of Adam was and how the blessed state was changed as a, as a result of Christ coming to redeem us okay, and to bring us back. Queen Abby, could you read the first Yeah, section? read it loudly, Abby. On it. Number, this is the one that says sections three and four. Okay. So read that whole paragraph of number three. Yeah. Yet more concerning the way in which one may come into the blessed state. But if human nature comes again into the blessed state it had in the beginning, through the incarnation of Christ, and if there is no other means, no other power, or wisdom, or labor, and struggle, struggle, whereby human nature might again come into the blessed state and become as it was created in the beginning, but it is solely in the hands of God who gave it its existence. And if there is no other means whatsoever to give him that blessed state, then what need is there for one to labor vainly, struggling for this by one's own ascetic exploits alone, by reading sufferings of evil, exhausting oneself with thirst, hunger, and vigils. And if such and so great sufferings of evil are in vain and profitless for one who does not know this great mystery of salvation, then upon every Christian lies the duty of learning it and knowing it, so as not to labor in vain in those sufferings of evil and not to allow his soul to perish even with them. Something more disastrous than any other disaster. <coughs> For all such and so great sufferings of evil should be undertaken not so as to come into the blessed state, but in order to preserve the blessed state, which we have received before through holy baptism. Since this treasure is difficult to preserve, and we must pay good heed that we preserve it, as the Holy Fathers have said. And in the future life, a Christian will not be tested as to whether he renounced the world, whether he fasted, whether he performed vigils, whether he prayed, whether he wept, or performed any other such good deeds in the present life, but he will be carefully tested as to whether he has some kind of likeness to Christ, as a son to his father, as the Apostle Paul says, My little children, over whom I am again to travail and, until Christ be formed in you, Galatians 4, 19, for as many of you have been baptized in Christ, have been put on Christ, have put on Christ. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, Sorry, John. Did I did, someone look in there? I did. When all the markers Did you used to mention the altar. Are they all gone? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Sorry, I'm not, uh, missing our, our board. <laughs> they disappear. For so, some. boy, I really need a marker. Yeah. Maybe it's in the paper. Maybe it's in the paper. Maybe. Maybe it's in the cupboard on the right. I'll look one more time. So, uh, basically, when a person is baptized, they're baptized and they're made, they're clean of all their sin that they've committed in this life. And then they're remolded and remade an image after the likeness of God. Not in the likeness, not like Adam, but similar to Adam. So there's some form of the likeness in baptism. So for instance, if you were to die two days later, you would have that at, you'd be close to that. You'd have some of that image of li image and, and likeness of God, so that He would recognize you. Because if there's a book that we have, and so what I like to usually what I just put up this one simple drawing. Just imagine, if you will, that there is a person here. I always make it look like an atom, and that uh, you find something. I found something. I don't think any of them work. Let me try one. Just to see. I think I went through this last week. Hi. Like I have a red one. Okay. All right. Look at that. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Purple. So if you take Adam. Adam. Person. 
So when they're baptized, then they're wiped totally clean. But a lot, what a lot of people, especially adults, do in their baptism is they drag through the waters the baptism a lot of those cares. At first, they feel very bright and they're feeling very good and gosh, isn't life great? But this is where sort of the unseen warfare aspect comes into the life. So you've been in the water, you've been purged of all those things, but here you are baptized, freshly made new, the white garment done, they don't have white, but newborn babe. Newborn, 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 babe. newborn babe. And, and slowly but surely, you begin to do this. This is what happens to people. They begin slowly but surely to drag those 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 ways of thinking. Those way, they begin, and the, all of this comes from the evil one. He is the one who is constantly peppering you with thoughts of depravity, thought, and all kinds of thoughts. You know, we wonder, you know, people ask me, well, how, you know, why does this happen and that happen? It's evil and dark because God allows us free choice, like he allowed Adam and Eve. But sometimes things happen to a person, like going to prison, where they actually come to their senses. They actually see the light, and they don't want to drag all that. They want to be forgiven all that and they want don't and they want to be remade new. And then whether or not they have the capacity to what the rest takes and to, to be able to resist the evil one means that you have to pray fast give alms. And I say the fourth one is tithe. The same. These are really important aspects of the Christian This all goes under one thing. But just to say, these are important aspects of the Christian life. We have to pray, we have to fast, we have to give alms, we have to tithe, we have to support. And so, when you are, that quote that we read from the first one, I, I am baptized and I'm, I'm crucified in Christ. It goes, I am crucified in the, this is the words of St. Paul, I am crucified in Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet Christ, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet Christ liveth yet, in yet me. Yet not I. Yet not, yet I, not but I, but Christ liveth in me. Right. And it goes on a little bit more. Than that. Yeah, I, I paraphrase it down to a few basics, but just to say that that understanding is called meekness. And in this case here, I think you can call it likeness to Christ. Likeness, because it says that we everything is in vain unless there's a likeness to Christ. And so we, through meekness and those other things that we're going to talk about more in the next section reading, sectional reading of uh, of the blessed state, you have to have some of these qualities to be in the blessed state so that God can recognize you. So you have some form of likeness, and this is where. The courage to actually take up your uh, cross and fight, you have to have that desire. You know, at some point in your life, you have to have the desire to fight. Fight for the salvation of your soul and for the salvation of others. That's where praying and fasting come in, where you start to, you're, you're, you're so sort of they, so this is, this, the blessed state can be called, Father Seraphim calls it passionlessness. that isn't even a word, but we actually refer to it as nipsis, or spiritual sobriety, like staying calm, staying in the middle, staying, that means to do that you have to be loving, you have to be forgiving, you have to be kind to everyone you meet, and we have real challenges here in Los Angeles, we have real challenges not even being kind to the people that we love or that love us, but just drive down the road and people cut you off and do all sorts of things. And I find myself, I try to come up with alternative ways of saying 
gosh, I wish you were a better driver, you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like it's really hard to actually, because it all comes out of reaction and reaction and reaction and things react really quickly. So if you ever see um, the way that, like, people end up in really bad situations, like, I'm not going to say exactly what happened, but I'll tell you that I know a person, put it this way, who was in a difficult situation, a lot of pressure was on, um, some, something about his, you know, somebody he knows that was being mistreated, and the person, he came upon that person, and he got really upset with that person, person didn't back down, and before you know it, he eliminated that person. And um, he's serving a long time in prison for it, 30 some years. So don't worry, he's, he's, he got locked up. But he came to recognize that that was a problem for him, you see. And so that's an extreme example of where that little ping happens and that other ping, and pretty soon you're, you're doing things that are, as Father Seraphim said, irrational. They're irrational. They're not passionlessness, they're not meekness, they're not humility. You see, but if you want to learn about humility <coughs> in the lives of people, then read some of those books in the library. They're very good books. I said Father Seraphim was saying uh, that you read the lives of the saints and read the Holy Fathers, but also if you want to find out about being like Christ, you read the scriptures, especially the Gospels. Or any part of the New Testament, but especially the Gospels, because that's Jesus himself living out who he is, and we're supposed to be like him. If we don't read the scriptures, we're probably going to be missing uh, uh, an element. Or well, two. this sounds very polite, because it's written by someone in the 11th century, probably, and very, uh, very polite when you're reading this. I mean, it'll get more... But Father Seraphim, when he talks about these topics, he doesn't really mince words about evil. You know, you have to learn to recognize evil so you can do good. You have to recognize what evil is. So if you have experienced evil in your life, which probably everyone in this room could say they have, some form of evil in their life, then you have to discern, you have to be able to say, I'm not going to do that. And you have to have the, the willpower and the gumption and everything, the chutzpah, whatever it takes, you have to have the ability to understand that you cannot possibly do it on your own. Without God's help, you, you are not going to get it done. And, and so it, 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 that's where meekness and humility come in. If you understand that, with what that quote from Galatians is, if you understand that I am crucified in Christ and the rest, you, you, you understand that, in fact, that it is... Um, it's all God's mercy. And so if God is merciful to you, then you have to be merciful to others. So let's read four. Uh, let's give, uh, who wants to read this one? Bob, you want to give it a shot? Try to read loud, Bob, so people that turn in the Lord. Well, I'm going to Those who keep the gates of the kingdom of heaven, if they do not see in a Christian the likeness of Christ, as a son to his father, will by no means open them to him and allow him to enter. But just as those who are like the old Adam, who transgressed the commandment of God, remain outside the kingdom of heaven, despite the fact that their likeness to Christ is not their own doing, since this is accomplished by means of the faith which they receive in Christ. The likeness of Christ consists in truth, meekness, righteousness, and together with them, humility and love of mankind. The truth is beheld in all one's words and meekness is all words spoken by others to themselves because one who is meek, whether he is surrounded by praise or reproaches, preserves himself passionless and is neither exalted by praises nor embittered by reproaches. Righteousness is beheld in all deeds, but just as we define the weight of things by means of scales, and just as we find out the quality of gold through polishing it against the stone, so also we do not depart from any undertaking from the boundaries of righteousness if in it we keep in mind those measures, means of measurement or scales which our Lord has given to us in commandment. Humility is as it were a treasure that cannot be stolen, which is formed in the mind that bears the conviction that only the power of grace received from Christ are there any good qualities to be shown in oneself. That is truth, meekness, and righteousness. 
Love of mankind is the likeness of God, since it does good to all men, both the pious and the impious, both good and evil, but those known and those unknown. Just as God also does good to all, shines the sun upon the righteous, shines the sun upon yeah. the righteous and the unrighteous, and sends rain upon the evil and the good. And so those who have received this from Christ have come up in a likeness to him, as the Son has from our Father the likeness of the Father. Because there is no Son who is not of the nature of his Father. It is for this that God became man, and through his union of the divinity with human nature, the divinity reigns over human nature as a condition. Then die bow and proceed prosperously in the time, because of truth and meekness and righteousness. Psalm 45, 5. Mm -hmm. 45, 5. Thus one, thus one over whom Christ has come not to be king to the virtues of which we have spoken, is not like Christ as to a father, and is unworthy to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In truth, so it is. Therefore, therefore all other struggles are in vain if they are not for the sake of these virtues. Let us also, brethren, strive to become like unto Christ by means of these virtues, that we may be vouchsafed his kingdom. To him may there be glory and dominion in the ages. Amen. There is a... Um book by um, uh, <coughs> by uh, the, the, the brothers of Platina is called uh, the meaning of um, the meaning of suffering and in one cover of the book it shows a person laying on a bed preparing to die mm -hmm. and all the family and friends it's and the priest it's an icon and in back is Christ and the guardian angel and maybe a couple others, but Christ is there. In the other one on the back, it has the same picture with Christ not there and the guardian angel turning his back on the person. And so it talks about the meaning of suffering. And this is something that as you get older in this world, and, and really not older meaning to be my age or even older, but to say, um, to be just to be as you get, grow into adulthood and get you you understand that you are going to suffer aches and pains and as older people we, every, getting out of bed is a great ex is a great excuse for having a few aches and pains and remembering your youth in a certain way when you didn't when you just bound out of bed but <coughs> or you know like a feeling I had the other day when I was watching this person jog on the road I remember jogging on the road myself and just kind of being able to run, for, run and run and not really get too tired. Now I'd have to walk, and I'd have to walk not as fast as running, and, and etc. And I'd be a little slower, and then recovery time would take a little bit longer because I'm older. But we see with in today's society, and in our parish alone, we lost two really wonderful women who had cancer and were taken out before their 45th birthday. You know, we're, we're, we're gone before their 45th birthday. They're very, very blessed women, I, we thought, we think, and probably very saintly, you know, to say the least. We're not proclaiming it. We're saying that they're very good people and they try to live very good lives. But we don't know, and so we pray for them. But to say that you don't have to be old to suffer, you can be young and suffer. I mean, if you go to the children's hospital, they have a, a ward there for children who have cancer and other death-bearing illnesses. And, uh, you know, I've met several of those because I work, when I worked at Pali, we had some students that, you know, had gone through that process. So you see, when we see children suffering, we really struggle with that. And, we, and people will even say things like, why is God allowing that? And what further out in the tape... When, when and, and further on in these in, in this book, book, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about when at, when he, when God says about the serpent and the woman that there'll be enmity, and that he will bruise the heel. The heel is a place on the body where there's not much blood, and it's, it's like, um, in other words, if that's all that the serpent can do for you is bruise your heel. That's not really that bad. But if bruising the heel means it takes away your hope, your faith, your love of, of God, then you're blowing that bruised heel up into being more than it is. You know, better, what does it, Jesus say about can you not, do not fear him that can 
take the body, but but if you're him who can take you know take your soul and hell, and hell. And hell right? And so we ha we have to always remember. These are the things we have to remember. So in learning and really struggling with in, in, in reading this book and, and what, what, what is associated with it, we have to understand, we need to understand as Christians that we have a law that's been given to us. It's a law. You can either follow the law or disobey the law. It's up to you. Let's find out if anybody had any questions. Before. Yeah, any questions? Or, or comments. Or comments. That, that commandment in the beginning in the garden was a law. It was a law. That's when the law started. That's when the law started. The law said, don't eat of that tree. Everything else, good. Don't eat of that tree. And the day you eat of that tree, you'll surely die. But it, And remember that it says that the reason why it was a law is because of the distinction between God and man. That God is unchangeable and doesn't is not unalterable, but man had to be given guidelines and and some kind of bearing, you know, like like you have to have your bearings because otherwise, how could man know what he was subject to? He he was too young, as Father Seraphim said, he was kind of like a teenager. He, he didn't really understand all the the dynamics of life. He was just really brilliant and and uh, and a lot of potential <laughs> right this is Adam so God gave him some uh, a grace by telling him and don't eat of that he could have said you're not ready for it but that could have fed his ego he didn't say that he said don't eat of that or you're gonna die well understand that Adam was a perfect man he was perfect he was superior to any man that lives today he was far superior and so you understand that he was superior, so therefore he had no reason to distrust anything God would say to him. He wa he talked with God daily. He never was without God. God was around him, and he was around, you know he, there was a connection there with him and Adam and Eve. And so therefore, when they pondered this serpent and what he had to say and all the things, it's like he had no reason. To choose that. There was nothing about that situation that would give him reason to do it. He wasn't hungry. He wasn't thirsty. He wasn't lacking for anything. But he was told, just don't eat of that one. He was lied to and he couldn't discern the truth. He didn't he, believe God. He refused. That's what that's that very act is evil. Yeah. And when he once he partook I know of how you can say it, Father. He met evil. When he met evil, he met it. He met it with evil, evil on evil. So instead of rising above it and being able to say, "No, God, you know, told me," he he succumbed to evil. Even when Eve gave him the fruit and said, "Here, have some," he easily he easily, if he had been wise and kept the wisdom that was given to him from the beginning, he would have said no. But he didn't. Obviously, we're here in, in this state, so it's good. It's it's like that's the only thing that he did. You might say he, you know, Saint uh, um, Ephraim the Syrian, not Ephraim, uh, Saint. Uh, the can we do it, Mark? Um, Saint Andrew of Creed says that Adam committed only one sin, and he was cast out of paradise. How many sins do we commit just waking up every day? You know, so that's why you want to de develop, for instance, the the, uh, the attitude of praying in the morning, praying throughout the day, praying in the evening before you go to sleep at night, clearing your conscience with everyone you meet, and you know, you know, begging forgiveness. You know, I had this experience, and this is not an exaggeration. I just want to say I say this because I, I don't want there to be an exaggeration with this. But I had this experience working at Pally High, a fellow who was a really nice guy, actually. And I was right in the heart of all this kind of stuff with the Sarah, Father Sarah from Latina and the whole thing. And so I was very excited about, you know, begging forgiveness and the whole thing. And so it seemed like I offended him. He and I shared a room, and it seemed like I offended him like all the time. And no matter what I said or did, it seemed like I offended him. 
And so I would just turn to him and say, his name was Greg. I said, Greg, I'm sorry, forgive me. One day I walked into the room, this is like three months in, he's saying, don't say forgive me, and don't say I'm sorry. And I said, well, that's impossible. I said, that's who I am. And he said, well, I don't want to hear that. It's an offense to me every time you say it. You know, and I, I, you know under, under, under that idea, he just didn't believe, he doesn't believe anyone's ever sorry, maybe because he wasn't sorry. You know, but I mean, he ever did as well. Who knows? But I'm telling you, it was like a minute and a half later, I said, well, forgive me, I'm sorry. He just blew up. And he went down to the principal's office and said, I can't share a room with that man anymore. Get him out of my room. So they actually gave me another room. And I moved out of that room. Because, and then whenever I saw him, I kind of go, <sighs> I had to let it cover my mouth. Cause I, because it's involuntary, it's like, why do you make the sign of the cross so much? Uh, fun? Uh, John, why do you make the sign of the cross? Oh, you know, it's uh, warding off evil, you know. Oh. <sighs> You're one of those? I am. I'm proud to say I am. And I make the sign of the cross again just for that. Because either I'm going to be offended or feel proud about the moment that I actually thought to make the sign of the cross. Whereas that's just, it's just what we do to ward off evil, to keep evil away from us, you see. These are the things that you have to engage in. And if it hurts someone's feelings because you did, it will say, forgive me. I, I had no intention. It's not about you. It's about my soul and finding salvation. If they want to know that much, you know, I'm just saying. It's very, seems impractical, but it is the most practical thing you can do if you are wanting to get to the blessed state. You want to be in the blessed state? Act blessed. Act like you've got something to give. You see? Because you do. If you're baptized, good man, you're, you have it all to give. If you're under the awning still, like catechumens, well, you, God can still rain on, 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 on can rain his, his, his blessings on you as well. Being a part of the church just seals it all in there. So that's the only difference, you know, really. So, so okay, so we're going to we're gonna end because we've gone over a little bit. Um, but now that we have the books, um, I was going to say that for one thing, you can read more about the life of Saint Simeon if you want to. Is the first third of the book about his life. It, it, we taught a class about it early on, but you can learn about him and learn how he can the re, the authority that he has in presenting these things is based on his own state of mind and heart and uh, his revelation, you know, from God. Um, he is called a theologian, which is not very common. There aren't, there's only three. St. John the Beloved, theologian, St. Gregory, the, the theologian, and St. Simeon, the new theologian. That's it. And all of the Orthodox, all And St. Gregory Palamas is almost like a theologian. Yeah. So next, we're going to be coming seven. to homily 10. They're not in order. It's not like one, two, three, four, five. It jumps around. This happens to be the 10th homily, but it's the third one we're studying. So you should read this. Um, and if you want the book, um, we finally got it. It usually sells for 12. We're giving a 20% discount. So comes out with tax on 1058. Yeah, it comes out uh, just uh, a little beyond the, the, the schism. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, uh, and then you can mark it. You can put your questions in the, you can highlight it. You can do whatever you want to with the book. And it's you're going to find it very rich and rewarding if you have your own copy. If you do, though, make sure you put your name in it, okay? It's a good book that you can have for your whole if life. If you decide to buy it, put your name in it. It's so really worth having. Story. It's really mm -hmm. ha having this book. There's a few books that we uh, that I always recommend that Orthodox Christians have. One is The Ladder of Divine Ascent, yeah. uh, and this is one. And then there's a couple others that I have a lot more books. I mean, I have lots of books at home. That's my own personal library that I've developed over the years. but. We don't it's sell even this. half of them in this bookstore, so it's, um, anyway. So read homily 10, if you, if you can. And also, if you want to find the Saint, uh, uh, the Sin of Adam, what was it called again? It's called, um, let me just tell you, it's called The Fall of Adam and Eve. By Father Seraphim Rose. It's on YouTube. 
and it's called The Fall of Adam and Eve, a talk by Father Sam. And I would say if you listen to it, don't listen to it just like all the way straight through. Listen to it part and parcel. Write down some questions or thoughts you might have, and then bring those questions back to the class, because uh, we're going to hear a little bit more of it next time. Probably put it, you know, we're going to hear more of it next time. Um, this gets deeper. This because gets I'm gonna com cause we're going to comment on what he's saying, because it's all in conjunction with the sin of Adam. And the fall. answer to, this is one of the things that I got out of this book. I'm not going to be here next week because I'm going out of town. But the, uh, one of the things that I got out of this book in general is, you know, that, that question, why do bad things happen to good people? That's always a barrier for people when they, you know, they just they have a hard time at loving a God who can allow bad things to happen, especially to children. And so the idea is that this is this this particular book answered that question more for me than any book I've read, except maybe the scriptures. So I just want to say, put in that plug for this because it's really a very, very deep. Any book. questions? Help. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't want to buy the Bible now. Yeah, I'm gonna go in the right in there now. Okay, hold on, one second. So are we suffering as a way of cleansing? Well, everyone suffers, right? Everyone suffers. And if you understand suffering, uh, like whatever it is, it is, I wouldn't call it cleansing. That sounds like uh, some sort of yogic uh, philosophy or something. But it's not cleansing so much as it leads you to repent. And in that suffering, you can find God directly sometimes because like, Ken, like Elder Ephraim, from St. Uh, Anthony Monastery says that people have, have found salvation in having cancer because it brings you to quickly to your mortality, you know. Now, the effect of children and this and that and the other, and we'll, get into, we'll get into more on that. But ultimately, it's because it's, it comes down to God's providence. God wills, God loves. But why God wills and why God loves is because he doesn't want you go to hell forever. He wants you to find paradise. And, and Christ said the servant is not above his master. And the, so the fact that he suffered, he told all his apostles. My kingdom is not of this he world. And so we have to remember that. This is the fall of love. Joy of all who sorrow and intercessor of the offense Feeder of the hungry, consolation of travelers, harbor of the storm, toss, visitation of the sick, protection, intercessor of the infirm, staff of old age, mother of God on high, flower of the immaculate. Hasten, we pray, and say, Thy slave. Very holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ, your God, and mercy on us. Amen. Thank you, everybody.